Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us for our own benefit, our own success, our own happiness, what is translated as, O believers, be mindful of Allah as He deserves. Worship your Lord. Worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as is His right upon you. And do not die, do not leave this world except in that state of submission. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us consistency upon Islam and the ability to die upon Iman. Allahumma ameen. We've given many reminders before about the success of the ummah at large as well as the success of the individual, the traits that the believer should have. Our khutbah today is about the ideal Muslim family, the traits of success that the ummah relies on when it comes specifically to the family structure. And a family does not mean you must have many people living with you, but rather we will talk about some of the details inshallah ta'ala. And the point of this is that wherever you are in your life, regardless of how much you've already experienced, regardless of your past experiences, young or old, good or bad, easy or difficult, that there are certain traits we look at that are emphasized in our revelation, emphasized in the sunnah, emphasized by the companions and the later generations and the many scholars that contribute overall to the well-being of society. And so today, primarily, we're focused on the family unit. Because when the family unit begins to break apart, when it starts to be impacted by different types of fitan, trials and tribulations, affected by external ideological pressures, affected by temptations, desires, or arrogance, or any of the diseases of the heart, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. The impact is on not just the children, is on that society, is on that community, and it has a ripple effect for many generations. So the first of the traits of the ideal Muslim family is the fulfilling of rights and responsibilities. That there are rights, and these rights are defined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So oftentimes when we talk about rights, usually the very first thing we talk about is the rights of parents. And why do we always begin with this? No matter how many times we hear it, we recite the Quran and we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Your Lord decreed you worship none but Him and to your parents be honorable. You find different variations of this command in the Quran four times. Worship Allah and to your parents be good, be honorable. Have bir. Bir is many things. Amongst them it is to be kind. Amongst them it is to be humble. Amongst them it is to treat them well. Amongst them it is to fulfill their right to treat them as parents. And bir al-walidain, no matter how many times we address it, we realize with the passing of time, the contrast between Islam and what's happening in Western nations and what's happening in society. The studies are finding 30, 40, sometimes 50% of people on this continent in North America specifically are estranged directly from one of their parents or one of their children, sometimes from their siblings as well. To be estranged meaning to cut off completely. They are cutting off, and this is a large number, 30, 40, or 50 percent. In some countries in Canada, Australia, the UK, many sociologists, many therapists are saying there's an epidemic in which families that are direct family here are cutting off one another very quickly and very easily. So when we talk about Birri al-Walidayn, Yes, we start with it, but we don't end with it. Birri al-Walidayn, to honor one's parents, is one of many rights of the creation that impacts society in many ways, that impacts what happens to some parents in their older ages, that impacts what you see in some of the homes here in this country, retirement homes and others. And so we know the many narrations when the companions would ask, who is most deserving of our kind treatment, our honor, our time, our presence, our love? Your mother, your mother, your mother, and then your father. This doesn't mean the father doesn't have a role, or the father does not deserve kind treatment, or the father doesn't have many rights. Absolutely not. But this emphasizes what a mother goes through. And in fact, an interesting tafsir jam is when you look at the ayat in the Quran emphasizing, وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا You will find some of these ayat clarifying even more why. Why to your parents be honorable? The father does so much no matter what, and we know this. But the mother is specified in these ayat. That the mother carried this child in hardship and gave birth as well, and there was hardship. The mother carried this child with hardship upon hardship, and we all know this. You know the experience. You know what a mother goes through or your wife has gone through. You know the reality of this, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifies this in the Quran. There's a young brother, maybe 25 years old. He was talking about why he, uh, how he converted to Islam and what led him to Islam. And then he opened up and said, and eventually my parents became Muslim. 
Somebody asked him, what, what did your parents think when you became Muslim? How did they react? What is it that led them to Islam? He said, they started noticing as I was learning about Islam and my practice changed. They started noticing a contrast between who I was before in terms of treating them in a specific way and who I was after becoming Muslim. They said, you used to ignore us, you used to talk back to us, you were so rude to us, you used to insult us, you used to cut us off, you were always isolated from us, you didn't regard us at all. And now you're treating us with kindness, respect, and honor. So what is it that changed? What is it that Islam is telling you to do? And so explaining to them what Islam was about eventually led them to Islam. Are there limitations to that right? Yes, there are. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us as well, despite the fact that birr al-walidayn is so important, وَإِن جَاهَدَاكَ لِتُشْرِكَ بِي If they tell you to commit shirk, then no, you cannot obey your parents. There's no obedience to the creation over the creator. If your parents tell you don't pray or insult this person or hurt this person or abuse this person, we know this already. It's a fact that most people are aware of this. What most people don't know is where the boundaries are. The boundaries and limitations of Birr al-Walidayn when, when it comes to some situations that we hear of where there is abuse coming from the parents or they are abusing the concept of Birr al-Walidayn to do something that Islam is not actually permitting or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not permit. But with this in mind, the family cannot succeed if the only right that is fulfilled is the right of parents. Because we know in Islam there is a right for the husband, rights for the wife, rights for the children that many parents are not aware of at times that your children deserve to be treated with love, with respect, treating them in a manner in which you care about their akhirah, showing them what Islam is about, teaching them what Islam is, teaching them who Allah is. When the family stops fulfilling one another's rights or there's an imbalance, someone will be hurt and oftentimes that resentment leads to many other problems and divisions as well. There's one study that found the people over the age of 65 when they were uh, surveyed they said family, 70% of them said family was one of the most important things in life. When they asked some of the youngsters under the age of 30, that number dropped below 50%, showing the generations that pass in this country are changing in terms of how they see parents, how they see family, that it's becoming a very individualistic society. It's all about me. And if I don't like it, if I don't like what you said, I'm going to cut you off. But that's not what Islam calls for. There is mediation. There's conflict resolution, there's forgiveness bringing people together. Without justifying ongoing abuse, there's bringing people together. And one of the factors as well that many parents and children should be aware of is mental health. That a lot of people are impacted in many different ways, so they are no longer putting up with one another. If I don't like what you said, I'm going to place a boundary here. And in fact, some sociologists have found that some of the talking points, some of the talking points that come from liberalism and individualism are in fact uh, in, in impacting people and incentivizing people and uh, motivating people to place boundaries in a, in a manner in which they should not be placed. That as soon as you dislike something from a family member, it becomes so easy to cut them off. Rather than to try to think, can I fix this situation? Can I resolve this matter? Can this relationship be uh, mediated? Can it be resolved? Can it be rectified in some way? People are placing boundaries in a manner that they did not place before. And many families are impacted by this, but again, sometimes it is the children, sometimes it is the father, sometimes it is the mother. It could be a number of factors, but we cannot ignore individualism. One of the other factors that always comes up as well is favoritism. When a parent treats one child better than they treat the rest of their children or the rest of their siblings. And oftentimes, we look at the narrations of the Prophet ﷺ in terms of taking care of your children equally, showing them love in a similar manner, and we wonder how it's possible for someone to know what the Prophet ﷺ taught and to still make one of your children start to hate the other or hate the parents because they saw throughout their lives that one child is treated in a certain way, said certain things about them and other things about the other children. This impacts people. And the last point here with regards to rights and responsibilities and the families in general is the changes in society when it comes to religious views, when it comes to ideologies and values and morality. There is no doubt whatsoever that if you do all you're supposed to do as a parent and you teach your child Islam, but you are also opening the doors, the floodgates of everything that is corrupt of ideologies, and at the same time you are trying to develop a good foundation, a foundation of Islam, they are being uh, basically bombarded with and they are taking in and consuming through movies, TV shows, bad friends, environments, schools, wherever it may be, all the things that are also trying to corrupt them, to secularize the minds, to brainwash people in a certain manner. 
And so you have this conflict internally that at times a parent does not realize. The second of six factors, six traits of the ideal Muslim family that contributes to success in terms of the ummah is the choice in one's spouse. The choice in one's spouse. And of course, as soon as we say this, many people think, well, I already made a choice. I cannot change it. Of course, when we talk about those who are still making these choices, we look at those who we learn from their experiences, such as many brothers, many sisters, who said over the years, like this one man, and I'm literally reading what he sent me and summarizing, he said he went through many challenges because he married after he, quote unquote, fell in love with somebody. They fell in love and they were so drained by this relationship, it was not a relationship built on Islam or similarities or anything else. They married based on their idea of infatuation or love, realizing years later their initial ambitions when they were teenagers, when they were college students, they started to be impacted in negative manner. 15, 20 years later, they ended up divorcing. Another example of this, a sister who told us she had this ambition for Islamic knowledge, Islamic studies classes, raising a Muslim family, but the marriage itself was so abusive, so problematic, so far from Islam. In a way, it discouraged her, impacted her ambitions. She became distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and she became distant from studying altogether, and their marriage also ended up in divorce. I'm not mentioning these to say that divorce is the fault of any specific person here, but rather the reality that when you make a choice with your friends or your marriage more than anything else, you are making a choice that will impact you. You cannot blame your husband, your wife for your spiritual decisions. You cannot say my husband, my wife does not want me to pray. I blame them for not being in the masjid all the time. You have to be putting in the effort and realizing if there is a conflict, it needs to be solved, it needs to be mediated. You cannot blame the other person while acknowledging no doubt whatsoever that the person you marry will impact you. The person you marry impacts you in so many different ways. This requires one or the other to take the initiative. How will we lead this family forward towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And of course, while people are making these choices and people have already made their choices, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put barakah, blessings, in the marriages of our brothers and sisters in every land and every place, for everyone is struggling with something. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to humility, to wisdom, to conflict resolution, to fulfilling the rights of one another, and to be amongst those who are constantly trying to move the family towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third is for our communities to know and for our families to know what a qawwam is. What is a qawwam? You find the, the, the usage of this word in the Quran and in the Sunnah as well. Basically, a man who leads a family forward. Does this mean that a wife, a mother does not have a role? Of course not. But specifically here, to have in this day and age the right understanding, meaning the Islamic perspective on what masculinity is, and not to be harmed by a secularized worldview, not to see the extreme movements that are very active today, that are attacking certain notions of masculinity and traditional ideas of what Islam says about marriage and men and women to the extent that now there's a backlash to that movement on the other end of the spectrum. And that extreme as well is very unhealthy where many men, many youngsters especially, are gravitating towards certain voices, certain influencers, certain ideas, certain people online because they are speaking in a very blunt and harsh manner as a response to the first extreme movement. The reality is, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الرِّجَالُ قَوَّامُونَ عَلَى nisa," This concept of a qawwam, a leader in other words, this concept has never been understood in Islamic history by any of these scholars, the companions, as being, for example, a dictator, as being abusive. These things are not allowed in Islam. We don't have that concept in Islam of a husband abusing his wife and just ignore it. He's the qawwam. That's not what a qawwam is. Because if we teach our communities and our children and our sons and our daughters, that the husband's sole responsibility is to have a source of income and therefore he's fulfilled his right, then we have not understood what a family is in Islam. The husband is responsible, yes, for the financial, but is responsible for the well-being that is emotional, mental, psychological, religious, for the family, for their safety, their security. The husband has to carry with, a, with a, the role of the qawwam. The husband is required to carry a responsibility before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the end of the day, that's what it is. It is a responsibility. And we all know that the responsibilities that we have in this world, we will be questioned about them. And as the Prophet ﷺ told us, every one of you is a shepherd and you're responsible for your flock. The husband is going to be asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about the entire family. 
Did you take care of the rights of your wife? Did you take care of the rights of your children? Did you take care of the rights in multiple facets of being a leader? So being a leader does not mean that it's a matter of power or control. Yes, there is a notion of hierarchy in Islam. There is, but it's not a hierarchy of abuse, but rather a hierarchy of progress, a hierarchy of leadership, a hierarchy that is beneficial for the family. Now, what happens when the hierarchy is abused? This is the question that's frequently asked. What about so-and-so? What about these kinds of men? What about these kinds of men? Those are not examples of what it means to be a qawwam. And we do not take these individuals as an example. Rather, we look for solutions in those situations and we find that the sharia provides a very comprehensive approach to solve these problems. Does this mean the husband has all the rights? No, the wife has so many rights in Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminded us through his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, on more than a dozen occasions to treat the woman in your family properly. To take care of your wives and the best of you, the Prophet ﷺ said, the best of you are those who are best to their wives. In another hadith, the best of you are those who are best to their families. The Prophet ﷺ did not leave anything of the family structure or the community that needed to be addressed except that he addressed it and he conveyed on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So husbands will be held accountable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wives will be held accountable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The children will be held accountable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to the most uh, appealing and the most uh, motivating and the most impactful families that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and beneficial for their communities. The fourth is the matter of love and respect and harmony between the spouses. The most cited ayah in almost every Muslim event in which there's a, a marriage, in which there's an engagement, it's the same ayah from Surah Al-Rum that many children have memorized this ayah and that's the only ayah that they know from Surah Al-Rum. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا From his signs that he created for you, pairs from amongst you, meaning uh, pairs uh, amongst men and women. وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً He created between you and commanded you in a way. Mawadda, a type of love, and this is one of the forms of love in the Arabic language. وَرَحْمَةً Unconditional mercy. That you are merciful to one another. What is it that leads to that love and that mercy? First, it is to respect that person for the sake of Allah. The second is to be unconditional in fulfilling their rights. That if you fulfill the rights of your husband or your wife, when they're treating you well, but you don't fulfill the rights that Allah revealed, when you don't like them on that day, when you had a conflict, when you disagreed, then you are not unconditionally doing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded. You're basing it off of how you feel and how they treated you. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded mawadda and rahma. This is for the husband and for the wife. This is something that requires us to look at situations. Like the example of, an example that is very common. A, a man reaches out or a woman reaches out. And he says, what are the absolute basic necessities I am required to provide for my wife from the sharia? I want to know what the absolute minimum necessities are. So a roof over her head, I have to give her food. She has to have basic clothing. I just want to know that. This question, yes, is a question of fiqh, the boundaries of what is required. But this question is a symptom that there's a problem in that relationship. That this person is not looking to treat this person well. They're looking at the absolute minimum. And oftentimes, it may be the other way around, where a woman will reach out and she will say, my husband is supposed to be spending this much because my friends are getting this much and they're complaining about worldly things in a manner that does not befit the one who is looking for mawadda and rahma, rather has been impacted by maybe materialism, by jealousy, by external factors as well. Or a wife who says, I want my husband to give me all my rights, but I don't want to give him any of his. The wording is usually different. The wording is not along these lines. The wording is usually, I want this and I want that. Do I not uh, deserve it? Am I not entitled to it? And I'm giving these very small, short examples for sure, knowing that there are many more details, nuances. It's a comprehensive conversation, a matter of education that we should continue with. And in fact, the very solution to this, to many of the marriages, is to have ongoing tarbiyah, ongoing ilm, learning, learning and growing. And it does not end. The Sahaba, some of them converted in their older ages, continued learning until their last breath. And some of the children of companions as well. That every one of us is in a place in which we can continue to learn, continue to converse, continue to talk about what it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects from us, where we are right now, and what we need to do to improve. And of course, this includes having uh, premarital education for many of the youth who are looking to get married in coming years, that you learn what it is 
to be a righteous husband or a righteous wife. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and protect us. With this as well as the reminder for many parents that as you're raising your sons and your daughters, that we raise them knowing what it means to be pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to be a righteous person, to fulfill the rights of others, to have good character, and of course to know what their rights are as well. Sometimes people are raised knowing what their rights are and given everything of this world, but they don't know how to give. They don't know how to support. They don't know how to serve others as well. Number five of six, and I will be very brief inshallah, is the matter of harmony of worldviews. There are many people who when they get married, they don't understand what the other person believes in at all. They have no idea. And other people will know to an extent, she's Muslim, he's Muslim. We generally agree on a few things, let's move forward. But at times there are many people in many of our communities who had a number of problems in their marriages and sometimes very severe problems when it came to their children and raising their children because they got married due to an initial type of infatuation, an idea of chemistry between two people, or she makes me laugh and he makes me laugh, so they got married. But then when it came to the reality of marriage, when it came to moving in together, when it came to raising children, where do you want them to learn? What kind of school do you want to send them to? How do you want them to learn Islam? Who are the scholars that you are going to listen to? Who are the people you won't listen to? These differences were not discussed in advance. And so people oftentimes are dealing with many of these conflicts because they realize their ideologies are in fact, even within the folds of Islam, very different. And there are many stories and many examples like this at the end of the day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, inna akramakum. عِنَّ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ The most honorable of you. عِنَّ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ In the sight of Allah are those who have the most taqwa, God consciousness. So before you look at all the other factors which you should look at when it comes to marriage, and I say this of course, especially to the youth, that you look at the factor or you look at the trait of what they believe in. Who are they in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And there are many other reminders. Again, the solution is for us to have awareness, for us to utilize the resources, alhamdulillah, that are in abundance when it comes to these types of classes and programs, and even for many parents to be involved in teaching their children what Islam is, what the worldview is that they believe in. There are many youth who have come to us who said, I want to get married, do you have advice for both of us? And then what do you believe in? Well, I'm a Muslim. What do you believe in beyond that? Who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We're not talking here about advanced aqidah. We're talking about very basic things. How do you want to raise your children? How do you want to live your everyday life? These are very basic worldview questions. And oftentimes that harmony is necessary for that marriage to flourish. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us in our communities. An example of knowing what the other person believes in is understanding uh, what they learned up to this point and understanding what they will do to learn in the future. Meaning, what are your references? Who are the scholars you will go back to? The councils, the institutes that you have access to, the uh, du'at, the students of knowledge, in order to ensure that the general, not every detail, but the general things that are important for you to agree on are agreed on. Who will you refer to and what will you do? An example of this, when it comes to how people talk about relationships in this country, of course, we don't need to give any examples, but there are many uh, clear proofs and many uh, trends when it comes to cheating, when it comes to hookup culture, infidelity, when it comes to open relationships, which of course is one of the, the trending things that is very problematic, this culture has many things that as the ideology changes, the conversation about relationships will change. The conversation in terms of marriage itself and what it means to be married will also change. Within the Sharia, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has permitted certain things in order for desires to be channeled in a certain way and told us and revealed to us and showed us through the Messenger وسلم, how to have a healthy marriage, how to live a righteous life, how to be a very happy person, and to take from the wisdom of the revelation and to implement it. So what is the point behind this? Some of the conversations that at times are very shocking that we still have is the fact that sometimes there's still a taboo, a sensitivity when it comes to a young man telling his parents he wants to marry somebody who was divorced before. And they have this notion that because she was married before and now she's divorced, this is not somebody you want to marry. And I'm not saying every single situation is exactly the same, but the fact that such a cultural taboo exists with something that the Sharia does not have, with something the companions, by the way, they did not find to be weird or problematic, reminds us and reminds parents and reminds their children that when it comes to marriage, look for that which is pleasing to Allah and don't worry about society. Don't worry about what people are saying. Focus on what is uh, beneficial and pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For there are people in different situations who will marry in different ways and their marriages are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are many sociologists who also say, no matter how disliked this may seem to some people, 
that the trends uh, within polygyny and polygynous relationships are also increasing in this country, very, uh, actually a very rapid rate. This is something that many people will be discussing in the future in terms of their types of situations and their types of marriages and what works for them, so long as it is done in a manner that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And lastly, the point of Islamic tarbiyah. There is no benefit in raising a child and giving them every material success possible and not giving them the tools that they need to succeed on the Day of Judgment. The tools that they need to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be able to pass the test of this life with success. To be able to be pleasing to Allah. There is no point in doing all of this if you are not saving your family. There is no point in disappearing for an extra two or three jobs unnecessarily for more and more and more wealth and your children never see you as fathers and as mothers. What's the point at the end of the day if there is no tarbiyah? There is no development. There is no teaching. There is no presence. Save yourselves and your families from the fire as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands. There is no substitute for motherhood. There is no substitute for fatherhood. Meaning that if someone is in a situation like a single mother, a single father, may Allah make it easy for them. But the situations in which somebody has a mother and has a father but they chose something else of a dunya over being present with their children, there is no substitute for that. There is no alternative for that. There is a war against parenthood. There is a war in this country when it comes to secularization and attacking, and this is very clear cut, attacking the role and the value of a mother. Whereas from the Islamic perspective, we see that without an um, without a present mother, there is no ummah, there is no next generation, there is no progress for our communities. If that presence, that love, that education that she has of Islam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if that is not there, these wars that are being waged and they have already started decades ago, will continue to hurt people in many ways. We may not fully, at times, see their impact, but the impact is clear-cut and it is there. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and our families. Ask Allah for forgiveness for you and your families and our loved brothers and sisters all around the world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the off-forgiving, the ever-merciful. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. A topic like this deserves hours and hours of workshops and conversations. These are just some summarized points for many other workshops and lectures that have been given. But at the end of the day, every one of us has a role. Even if you've already raised your family, you already raised your children, alhamdulillah, or your parents have passed away, may Allah have mercy on them. There is a role when it comes to birril walidain. Make dua for those who passed away. There is a role when it comes to your children, that you be present for them. There is a role when it comes to perfecting or improving the marriage that you have that is so valuable in the sight of Allah. The same way that you invest in something else you see value in. That marriage in the sight of Allah is one of the greatest forms of reward, one of the greatest opportunities for reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every one of us can try to teach others or for our own families to initiate good traditions, good habits within that family, to have weekly lectures, to have weekly halaqat with the children, to connect with one another. Parents at times are uh, delegating the teaching of Islam in terms of their children to someone else or to online or to the, the masajid. Parents as well could be, as many are, learning and giving, learning and giving as they are progressing with their children. And at the end of the day, glad tidings, glad tidings, glad tidings to the families that live upon Iman and die upon Iman and their children and, and descendants follow them with Iman. They will be gathered in the highest levels of Jannah. If they reach Al-Firdaus, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the highest levels of paradise with our loved ones and with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.